Hello, welcome to Convergent Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I am talking with Simon Morden. Simon is a scientist and a science fiction writer. He has a bachelor's in geology and he has a PhD in geophysics. He has spent a large part of his career writing novels. He's written 10 novels and a few novellas. And as he says in the beginning of the conversation, he's recently gone back to to writing more about uh, actual science, uh, nonfiction, instead of just only writing uh, his uh, fiction books, which have been very well received. He is the author of the latest book, The Red Planet, A Natural History of Mars, and that is what we talk about in this conversation. We start the conversation by talking about what is the current data we have on Mars? How do we know these things? Talk about the origins of the universe and how Mars formed. We talk about the importance of the great dichotomy. We talk about the features of Mars in the pre-Noachian period. We talk about the two moons of Mars. We talk about the Noachian period and how water was on Mars for a long time. We talk about the change of climate and atmosphere in the Hesperian period. We talk about rust and how Mars became the red planet. We talk about the Amazonian period. And we talk about the difficulty of getting humans to Mars. And his views on the more recent realism in science fiction, uh, movies, television shows, and novels. I have to say, this conversation was super fascinating because Mars is one of those planets that we talk about and we want to visit and we you know think about it and write about it and tell our stories about it and it was incredible to actually get someone on to talk about the data who has a background on this and has a really really fresh perspective his book is fantastic it's very readable um, and i can't recommend it highly enough and so now i bring you simon morgan I am here with Simon Morden. Simon, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I'm uh, really excited to talk to you about uh, a topic I don't talk about that much. And so I'm, I'm really, really interested to uh, talk to you and, and hear everything that you have to say. Um, so before we get into it, just tell listeners who you are and, uh, and what you do. Hi, um, my name is Simon Morton. Um, I'm more commonly a science fiction writer. Um, I have... At the last count, about 17 novels and mm. two short, short story collections out. Um, in a former life, I was a university researcher um, doing uh, research on meteorites. Um, that was well, 30 years ago now. So, yeah, mm. I've, I've been around a bit and, mm. and now I've, I've come back. I've come back to uh, to space stuff. <laughs> yeah, well, you, you've written a, a really, really wonderful book called The Red Planets, A Natural History of Mars. So Mars is something that has captivated our imaginations here on Earth for, you know, forever. Um, but maybe I'll, I'll, I'll leave some time and we can chat a little bit about some science fiction, too, in there. So. Sure. Um, but let's let's first start talking about like just the just the, the big question here is Mars. You know, I guess one one question I do have is just that: why are we obsessed with Mars? You got Elon Musk wanting to go there, NASA's you know saying you know we put in rovers there, but you know it's it's again it's captivated our imaginations in science fiction and films and television shows and um, you know why 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 do we like Mars? Why are we so interested in it? Well, I mean, a lot of it started simply in, in prehistory. Um, you look up at the night sky and there are all these white points of light. And mm. Mars is the only one that is identifiably a different color. Mm. Um, so we, we impute a lot of um, meaning into that. So, you know, Mars is, is, is the war god in in. Babylonian and Akkadian and Greek and Roman history. Um, so, so we've always given it special meaning. Um, and we've known it's been a planet since, since prehistory. Uh, the big deal is it's far enough away 
to be different and interesting mm -hmm. um, without being obvious as to as to what it is we look up at the night sky and we can see the moon and it's cratered and and we can see we can see that it's it's a barren lifeless world but mars is is far enough away that we can we can look at it and we can project our dreams mm. onto it mm. uh, whatever whatever you know if it's edgar rice burrows or hg wells we can we can literally project our hopes and fears onto onto a different stage mm. and i think that's 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 a big part of it mm. yeah it, it does have this kind of um I, I like the way you're talking about the distance of it it's far enough where it's not too close you know the moon is is right there right let's just as an example um but yeah i guess there is a kind of i know we'll probably talk about it you know there's the the red color that we know now and so obviously being on the planet with various uh, instruments and taking all these wonderful pictures is fascinating so what is the current data we have on Mars, if you were to just give a brief overview to just describe the planet, um, the climate, the soil, the water, if there's any atmosphere, unique features, what is, how would you give the, the two minute version of how we just describe Mars now with all of okay. our up to date data? Sure. So uh, Mars is, it's cold. Um, during the day it can you know on a summer's day mars has seasons uh -huh. uh, summer and winter in pretty much the same way that we do um set roughly the same axial tilt uh, as we have but mm -hmm. but mars mars's year is 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 significantly longer um about uh, uh one and a half, 1.9 of our years is is how long it takes to rotate around the sun um, so summer and winter, um, a nice balmy summer day. We can get up to 25 degrees centigrade. Um, mm -hmm. We're looking at you know, early 70 Fahrenheit. Mm -hmm. um, but because Mars really doesn't have that much of an atmosphere, um, atmospheric pressure on uh, sea level on Earth is about 1,000 millibars. Uh, on Mars, it's 6 millibars. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's quite a ferocious vacuum um even though obviously there is some some atmosphere there so there's no buffer between day and night so the the day temperatures can get quite high and at night time on the same day that it's 25 degrees during the day it can get down to minus 60 mm. Mm. at night so it gets genuinely very cold um so we've got very little atmosphere um but what atmosphere there is the sky is blue um because of atmospheric scattering uh of of the light um mars has clouds on occasions um rare but they're definitely there more common in winter than they are in summer um mars has frost at the uh, just before dawn um, when it's cold enough then whatever gas vapors are in the air be it carbon dioxide or, or water vapor they will freeze out and they will form frost which then burns off as, as a very brief mist uh, there is absolutely nothing on mars that even you go to a desert even and 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 this is this is one of the one of the, the big things that that is a real difference is you go to a desert and you'll you'll see the old scrubby bush um, mm. you will see you know some you know insects and things rolling around there is absolutely nothing there there is absolutely nothing the place is barren Mm. as 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 a as a newly formed volcanic island it's just it's just a and there is a there is a terrible beauty about that barrenness we we see the the pictures from from the rovers mm -hmm. come along and mm -hmm. and it could be earth but we know it's not 
And mm. I think that's that's one of the that's one of the again one of the with the draws we 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 look at it and we kind of recognise that sort of badlands mm -hmm. landscape. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there's, there's nothing there. There's nothing at all. I guess that the, it, there's a, I think there's a beauty and a, and a, and a horror to that. This is this barren planet, you know, and we're talking about not a, not a country, not a continent, a planet that has yeah. nothing. It's is a very, there's, there's something really beautiful about that and really terrifying at the same time. I guess I know we'll come to the atmosphere thing, but I guess the, the question I have here is, you know, there's, you know, we can talk about some of the, obviously the history of, of what we know about the planet, but you know, how accurate was it to get a good mapping of Mars, right? Like how we haven't been, we don't have rovers that are on all different parts of Mars. How do we know that there's nothing else on the planet and how do we have all of the mapping we have for the planet? Um, how, how have we been able to, to get that information over time? Sure. So uh, the first, Decent maps we had, and 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 this is this is one of the the extraordinary things that that back in the in the the nineteenth century, uh, where people are working literally with brass telescopes and lenses they've ground themselves out of blocks of glass, uh, and they turn them on Mars, and they could make maps of Mars. Now they weren't great. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but they could tell that there was a, a, a North Pole that was brighter and a South Pole that was brighter, and, and they could detect the, the colours and the variation of the colours in between. Um, we only really found out what Mars properly looked like with the Mariner probes um, back in the, the late 1970s that, that went by. And... We were able then to, to start differentiating between which bits of the planet looked, um, looked flat and which, ones, which bits looked rugged and highlands and stuff like that. But it's really only been in the last 20, 30 years. I mean, you have to remember that um, uh, Viking was, was in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so we needed to know then what we were doing i mean we're not just going to sort of just literally fire stuff at mars and kind of hope it gets down um there, there was there was there was method there so we needed some decent maps and mm. in the same way that the earth is is encircled by by satellites taking pictures of the planet we now have some very good satellites in orbit around mars sending mm. us back all manner of, of pictures, resolutions down to mm. one to two meters. Wow. Um, and, and every time the, it, they, the satellite goes overhead of a different part of Mars and produces better pictures, we learn so much more each mm. time. Um, the, mm. the, the level of, of accuracy. And you can, you can see these things. If you, if you go on to, if you have a, a copy of Google Earth, Mm -hmm. uh, the standalone uh, program on your computer. You can switch it to Google Mars. Mm, that's really and cool. And you can you can just look at the pictures yourself. Uh, it's mm. astonishing, and mm -hmm. they update it. It's it's just terrific. Mm. So that's how we know what Mars looks like. Um, and and yeah, it's like I say, it's accurate enough now that we can we can dump stuff on Mars mm -hmm. uh, with with a tolerable degree of accuracy. Yeah, there's a there's a always this interesting thing. I, I'll I'll merge your two worlds here together for a minute. I feel like anytime we talk about other planets or think about all other planets, we our prior is Earth. So we're mm. always comparing it to Earth. Right? Oh, sure. You see this in science fiction novels all the time. It's always, well, they have a language and they have different languages or how they communicate or something with their sentient beings on another planet or something. And it's, and it might not be that way or it might be very different. And so, you know, we're, there, there's no oceans at the, at the moment on Mars, you know, and where there should be because that's how Earth is or whatever. It feels like we're always comparing it to, um, 
our planet, which I guess you could see as a, as a, as a normal thing, if that's all, you know, but it is interesting to think that there's, you know, hundreds and thousands of planets, you know, in the universe and they're all going to be a little bit different, but that, but I kind of, to the point you said earlier was it looks sort of like earth, right? Mm. You see the, you know, kind of a desert or red rocks, like in maybe Utah in the United States, or, um, you know, you see mountains or things like that, or craters, if you will. But there's these things where it's like, Oh, that kind of sort of looks like earth, but it's not earth. Right. Yeah. Which is, which is very yeah. interesting. Um, so, so again, you don't have to give us the whole long history. You do a little bit of it in the book, but the, so, you know, many people have written about the origins of the universe and have tried to describe it. And, you know, most people have some idea of, a, of a, an event, a big bang or what have you. Um, although other people have said other things about that. So, but in, in terms of how we get to our solar system, you know, how do we understand the origins of Mars as it, as it's forming, uh, in the beginning, um, you know, when did that happen? I mean, obviously Jupiter is supposed to be really important and it's really early. And so how do we understand kind of a kind of loose, large scale chronology of how Mars came into existence to begin with? Okay. So let, let's strap in and do this, uh -huh, do this yes, from the start. Yes. <laughs> um, we, we know um, and, um, and and we're yeah. When I say we know, there's 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 a fair amount of conjecture here, and a lot of this is is based on the fact that we have eight planets <laughs> plus Pluto. Um, <laughs> honorable mention there, um, and we know how it turns out. Mm -hmm. So whatever model of planetary formation we, we we come up with we know what the end result has to be so any any model that we that we have that doesn't come up with with the planets of the right size in the right order it, we're just going to have to reject that so so it doesn't narrow things down a bit so this is roughly what we think's happened happened um, in the past. So somewhere 100, 200,000 years before the solar system really came to life, um, you've got a, a huge, uh, and, and we're talking light years across, um, dust cloud that is between the arms of um, two of the arms of the the Milky Way, so it's it's literally in dead space, mm. um, nothing there, and a nearby supernova. Uh, I, these 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 explosions are are just just immense. So, you know, anything within sort of you know, twenty thirty light years is going to just die because of the radiation but the shock wave carries out from from these from these massive star explosions and if they happen to to hit one of these big dust clouds that is literally in the middle of nowhere it will stir it up now because it's stirred up there are variations in gravity between um, one part of it and another part of it. So from that point, it is believed that this immense dust cloud broke off into, into significant size segments, still, you know, half a light year, a light year across, uh, containing all of the elements that now go to make the solar system. Um, because of the variations in density, you've got local pooling of gravity uh, and the cloud starts to contract. Um, as it contracts, it gets denser. Uh, because it gets denser, it contracts faster. Mm. So you've got this runaway thing. Um, now, a lot depends on the spin of the cloud. Mm. Uh, if the cloud's not spinning particularly fast, then all of the material ends up being sucked into the middle and you just get one big star 
mm. uh, and and that's that's what happens. But if cloud is spinning, so you've got a hot, dense middle of of dust and gas, and you have like um, best way of describing it is like a sombrero. Mm. Uh, so you've got a disc of mm -hmm. material that's coming out from the middle. Um, everything in that disc goes to form the planets and everything in the middle goes to form the sun. Uh, at some point, the mm. material in the middle gets so close together and so hot that um, it just squashes everything down and nuclear fusion occurs. Mm. Um, but what's happening in the, in the, the, the brim of the hat at this point is that you have localized points of extra dense gravity. Um, and these are the, these are going to be not the planets themselves, but the proto planets. And we can mm. be talking up to sort of uh, thousands of, of proto planets. Um, the dust grains stick together. They, they form these tiny little glass beads called chondrules um, that, that uh, condense out and collide with each other and, and remelt. Um, and, through various stages, um, these chondrules become bigger agglomerations of material. We're talking, you know, we're talking things that are meters across, and then tens of meters, then kilometers, then hundreds of kilometers across. Uh, and they will go around. Initially, when they hit each other, they will break up. But if they get large enough, you start mm. to see they will start, you know. They will hit each other, and then the debris will accumulate. So you've got something that's now is twice as big. Um, and it's a gradual winnowing of, mm. of this so that you've got all these protoplanets, and then slowly, 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 I mean, I say slowly, we're talking you know, 100,000 years here, these things will, will start um, fining out into a few large bodies. Um, mm. And and that's where we get our planets from. Hmm. Now we don't know the order here uh, necessarily, um, but I guess when we talk about Mars, where do we think Mars comes on the scene here? Were there other planets at some form, maybe already there, um, or not quite, or we just don't know, or is it is it a later planet, earlier? What do we think? Well, so far, all, all, the, all the, uh, the data that we have indicates that Mars formed quite early on. Um, and it was... I'm going to have to mention Jupiter here because Jupiter is the yes. real bully <laughs> in the schoolyard. Um, and obviously, Jupiter is, is just, I mean, I'll say just the other side of Mars. But, but it's it's the, the next one out um, and and Jupiter is about as big as any planet can ever get. Mm. If Jupiter had more mass, it would be physically smaller in size because that mass would mean that everything would be much more dense and it would it would start to contract. So Jupiter's huge. So Jupiter hoovered up most of the mass of the of the solar system it is that big so you've got jupiter you've got saturn beyond it and then uranus and neptune beyond that so they're they're the big gas giants and you've got these relatively little terrestrial planets mm -hmm. um, on the inside but because um jupiter is is just the other side of mars uh mars formed early but it formed quite small um you, you we look at mars and we think oh you know it's a bit like earth but mars is one tenth of the mass of earth so it's it's not very big in comparison um and it's about half the uh diameter um, so, so it's it's a much smaller planet than than either Earth or, or Venus into it. So, if Mars formed early early doors, um, then it is quite likely 
because of, of the, the effect of Jupiter, that there were very few other large planetary bodies uh, hanging around in roughly the same orbit. When I say large, we're talking you know, of, of equal size or, mm -hmm. or half the size or something like that. Whereas for Earth, again, as far as we, you know, one of the best theories for, for, for lunar formation is that Earth got a real smack from mm -hmm. something that was literally Mars-sized, mm -hmm. um, which was in the same orbit as as earth um early early on um so mars was was yeah mm. pretty much early mm. well and, and and in these early days um you know as it was formed as a as a planet what what can we say about the very big so earth is a or excuse me mars is a planet now how what are the early days like um you, you said that it never had massive impacts like other planets how, how could this be and what about the 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 core and or crust of mars what is that potentially like okay so one of the one of the most bizarre things about mars is because um it formed further away from uh the sun uh it got a, a bigger share of the the volatile gases um, and, and, and things like water, ice, uh, carbon dioxide than, than Earth did, which meant that early Mars uh, had an atmosphere that was two to three planetary radiuses larger than than the actual planet itself so so i mean earth's atmosphere at the moment i mean we can we can reasonably say it's about 100 kilometers up um mm -hmm. from 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 ground level mm -hmm. to the top of the atmosphere so so mars's atmosphere was ah, somewhere around the region of six to eight thousand kilometers tall Mm. Um, and the surface pressure at that point would have been two to three hundred atmospheres. Mm. Um, so, so we're talking absolutely crushing pressure, uh, ridiculous temperatures. We're talking you know, seven, eight hundred degrees. A uh, bit much like the the surface of Venus is mm. at the moment, um, and. The atmosphere would have been would have been incandescent, uh, you know, even though it consisted broadly of steam and carbon dioxide. Um, you know, it, obviously too hot to rain, um, and and the surface of Mars, uh, the the crust would have been belching out. Mm. All of all of this gas from from the, the from the inside of Mars through huge gashes in the in in the surface, um, it would have been it would have been terrible place, <laughs> genuinely awful. <laughs> This is a very, very violent planet. <laughs> oh, ghastly! Yes, <laughs> yeah. you you talk about the uh, the is it the the Helos crater? Um, yes, and uh, and the Great Dichotomy. Tell tell us what is this Great Dichotomy? Okay, so if you look at a picture of Mars, um, one of the things that you can tell straight off is that the the top half of Mars is is relatively um, dull and featureless. Mm. Um, it, the bottom half of Mars is much more heavily cratered, um, mm. and and we you know we saw that and we thought well, that's that's interesting, uh, and we called it the the Great Dichotomy because literally half of the planet is is mm -hmm. is one and half the planet is the other. But we didn't realize just how significant this was um, until we started measuring how high Mars was. Um, mm. we, we knew we knew that you know the, the volcanoes were tall uh, and the bottom of craters were deep. Um, but it turns out that the the top half of Mars, the, the northern hemisphere, um, is around four to five kilometers. Uh, it's, you know, about three miles lower than the southern half of Mars. Wow. Um, so it's like you've got um, 
two unequal sized balls and you've just stuck them together. Mm. Um, and so the top half of Mars is, is, is lower than the bottom half of Mars. So we need an explanation for this. Mm. Um, and the whole, the whole thing is, is, really odd because we don't see this anywhere else mm -hmm. now now we have two theories one is the impact theory um and and this obviously this 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 now completely denies my my previous discussion <laughs> about uh, you know no huge impact so so this is not my favorite story but i'm giving it to you anyway so so mars in in its orbit um it didn't have any of the big planet crushing impacts that the say earth had mm. um that would completely remelt the surface and remake the surface of of, of earth uh when it collided with the the mars sized impact uh very early on uh, but the great dichotomy could well have been formed by an oblique shunt I suppose a, a low velocity shunt with mm. with a a pro protoplanetary body that was left over from the formation of the solar system. So it basically gouged out a whole stack of material from the top half of Mars mm. and literally dumped it on the bottom half of Mars. Mm. Um, I don't find that obviously you know if you if you roll the dice often enough you will end up with that scenario. And obviously, we have to try and explain the great dichotomy um, somehow. But my preferred argument is, is to do with the, um, the way that the, the core and the mantle underneath interact. Mm. So you've got an iron core at the center of Mars, and it's belching out a lot of heat um, in the same way that, that Earth's core does and the the mantle rock which is everything between the the metallic core and the the rocky crust um is is also rock but it's under such high pressure and temperature that it flows uh, like like wax flows um if you if you can imagine that or or pitch um if you have a extra extra high temperatures which like, you know i know they've had out in, in california recently the top of the road will start to melt and mm. it will deform and that's the kind of of speed of of movement of rock that, that we're talking about here so heat has to get from the core to the surface um, and the mantle starts to flow in these huge uh, gyres of, of rock um, and on earth we have several of these 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 risings and fallings of of mantle rock and that's where we get our plate tectonics from mm. um, they they push the crust around they break it and they make it collide because of Mars's size um, and where it formed in the solar system, it's it's a theory that Mars didn't have lots of these these mantle plumes, these these hot geysers of rock coming up from the from the core. It had one. Mm. Um, so wherever it wherever it started uh, and wherever it was pointed it was basically just pushing against the underside of the of the crust in one place um, and because it was pushing in one place the the crust starts to move away from it in in a concentric circle um, just keep on moving as the the mantle uh started pushing against the crust it obviously it cools um and literally halfway round the the planet at the other at the other side uh you will get the descending cold rock that starts to peel away the crust so you end up pushing the crust up on one side making mm. it higher mm -hmm. and you end up dragging it down on the other making it lower mm -hmm. so that's my preferred option here um it seems just a little bit more likely 
Um, but I was, I was I'm, I'm ask, not saying anything against the other one at all. No. <laughs> <laughs> why? Why is that your preferred one? Is it just more plausible that it could happen this way, or do you feel there's more evidence for it, or why? Why this preference? Okay, so there is a little bit of evidence for this. Um, now, back in the, the 1950s and the 1960s, um, when plate tectonics, I mean, this is, this is, this is really quite uh, an odd thing to say, when plate, tonic, plate tectonics on Earth was still just a theory, mm. um, and mm -hmm. this, is, this is 1950s and 1960s, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. someone had the idea of taking a ship with a magnetometer and sailing it across the Atlantic uh, and across the, the oceanic ridge that we knew that was there, that was believed to be one of the plate boundaries. And what we found was that as the magnetometer was towed across the, um, the uh, parallel to the uh, perpendicular to the ridge, that it recorded positive and negative magnetic pulses. Uh, and it has to do with which way the Earth's magnetic field was pointed when the rock was formed. So we ended up looking at these stripes either side of the, the North Atlantic Ridge. And you could actually detect that these stripes in the rock were mirror images of each other. Mm -hmm. So we could see that, well, if that rock was formed then, it um, the the magnetite in the in the lava was 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 all pointing north at that time, and then the magnetic field changed. So you get a band of south facing rock, and then north and south, and north and south. So you can see the bands of, mm. of like a like on an old style uh, magnetic tape. On Mars, there are hints um, of a literally a bullseye of magnetic um, recording. So mm -hmm. you have a, a center, which is of, of one polarity, and then you've got another ring, which is another polarity, and you've got another ring outside that, which mm -hmm. is of a third polarity. So that is some kind of evidence that the crust was formed at different times um, in a in this concentric ring manner, uh, emanating from one single point. Mm. That's it's so fascinating how there seems to be again as a type of parallel here, right? There's, there's a mm. small, but there's a kind of a small parallel here, which is which is fascinating. So tell me, I mean, I have to say, I mean, much like uh, for, for listeners, much like uh, how you're explaining things, this is very much how your book reads as well. It's very accessible. It's very easy and very rich with, with information. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm quite enjoying uh, uh, all, of the, all of the information you're giving here. Um, okay, so tell us about the moons. There are two moons for Mars. Is this correct? This is this is correct. Uh -huh. um, and, and how, are they, how are they important for, for Mars? Obviously, our moon for Earth is super important, but for Mars, or yeah, how did the moons there work for for Mars as, as best we know? Okay, so when Earth has this ridiculous outsized moon, I mean, it's absolutely mm -hmm. huge in in comparison to to the planet itself. Mars has genuinely pathetic moons, and <laughs> and I can only apologise for for the for the for the lack of of, of moonage uh, on on Mars. Um, so there's Phobos and there's Deimos, um, and and they are relatively tiny and and just just a little bit rubbish. Um, they will never. They would never have have pulled up. Um, a a a tide from from the Martian oceans, um, and it's it's currently really uncertain as to whether these these moons of Mars are simply captured asteroids mm. that have that have come too close, or or whether they did actually um, form out of uh, stuff of Mars that was was thrown out by by one of the one of the the big uh, cratering events. Mm. Um, one of the interesting things 
about Mars uh, and, and, and Phobos in particular is um, there was a theory in the, in the 1940s and 1950s that we could just about measure the, the mass of Phobos. Um, and a Russian scientist calculated that due to the size and shape of, of, of Phobos, it could be explained as a, a around a, sort of like a two, two, three meter thick um, shell of iron mm. and nothing in the middle. Wow. So it could, you know, his, his theory was that, that this was a, an alien artifact. Mm. Um, and of course, everyone's going, but that's outrageous. This will disprove it then. And, <laughs> and no one could because no one had a good picture of the moons of Mars at this point. <laughs> so it was only when we actually got genuinely decent pictures of, mm -hmm. of, of the Martian moons could, could actually anyone disprove this, this mad Russian scientist who said, Oh, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a spaceship. Mm -hmm. It's, it's an artifact. It's a, it's, it's, <laughs> it's something that's been left by the Martian empire for us to discover. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's not, unfortunately, uh -huh. <laughs> that would have been cool, uh -huh. but yeah, it's not. That's <laughs> very funny. Um, I'm sure we'll come back to the to the moons, but you you in this part of the of the book, uh, I'd say the back half of the book, you walk us through four billion years of history, right? So this is all basically yeah. the the precursor and luxury stuff. So you 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 start us in the the Nokian period, which is four point one. No yeah, Noachian. To, Noachian, yeah, excuse me, yeah. to 3.7 billion years. And then we get to the Hesperian, am I saying yeah, this right? Yeah, that's right, yeah. And then the Amazonian, yeah. and then the uh, and then we get to kind of present day. Yeah. So these are kind of the um, uh, three major uh, periods. And so talk us through the first one, which covers, you know, a, you know, a good, a good chunk of time, again, 4.1 to 3.7 billion years. Um, just tell us about this period. Obviously the, the great dichotomy leads into this period. This is this sure. how you describe it? Um, but just tell us, give us the overview of, of this period. Okay. So everything that, um, Everything that happened before the the Noachian is is known as the pre Noachian, as mm. it is a, in a in a in a genuine effort to to not make it sound attractive at all. Um, we know very little about the pre Noachian. Um, mm. The defining the defining moment of of the Noachian period is the formation of the Hellas crater, which is. Uh, an absolutely huge crater um, on the southern hemisphere of Mars. Um, it, it basically blew a hole that was uh, somewhere around um, five miles deep mm. on the on the surface of Mars. So, so that's that's a that's a big hole, um, and that threw out so much debris that a lot of the information from the, the pre noachian period just literally disappeared under a blanket of rock. Mm -hmm. So if we say, well, okay, so we've, we've got this um, surface of Mars now. We've, we have the great dichotomy in place and um, the top half of the, the planet um, is lower than the, the bottom half of the planet. Mm -hmm. Really odd things start to happen at this point um, because the atmosphere, and I, I, we talked about that earlier, the, this mm -hmm. ridiculous sized atmosphere. Now, Mars is far too small to keep that atmosphere. Um, and also, as far as we know, the um, Mars doesn't have a magnetic field now. So at some point in the, the pre-Noachian, the magnetic field failed. Um, and the noatic, our magnetic field is basically what keeps our atmosphere from being stripped away by the sun. Mm -hmm. uh, all the particles from the sun uh, 
constantly bombarding the top of the atmosphere, um, stripping away molecules, just pushing them out into space. Um, so this this huge atmosphere uh, that was was two to three hundred bars and and thousands of kilometers out into space contracted to something that was much more amenable to to temperature and pressure. So we're talking about something that's probably two to three atmospheres at this point, um, and the surface temperature fell to something that was you know, well within the, the bounds of liquid water. Mm. Now, if you remember that the top half of Mars is lower than the bottom half of Mars at mm -hmm. this point, mm -hmm. we end up with when it rains, all the water is going to flow north. Um, it's going to it's going to fall on on the the southern highlands, and it's going to it's going to make rivers, and it's going to all pour into this northern basin. Mm. Um, and and if you if you imagine looking at the planet, uh, and there's a coastline. Um, it's a coastline which is defined by both the the dichotomy itself um, mm. and and the craters that, that are overlapping across it so there are these you know, huge crescent shaped, shaped bays cut into the into the dichotomy itself um, and the top the whole northern part of Mars is miles deep in water Mm. Uh, you can you can literally sail from from one side of Mars across the pole, uh, no ice at this time. It's all far too warm um, to the other. Now you will have erosion uh, in the same way that you know, you've got you have a flash flood in mm -hmm. in the in the badlands in in the deserts, and all of the loose debris gets washed into the into mm -hmm. the um, into the northern base. That eventually is why the northern half of Mars looks flat and uninteresting. It's because you've got a billion years worth of sediment mm. that is collected in, in this ocean basin. Um, still no free oxygen. Um, there, as far as we know, there has never been anything other than a carbon dioxide and water vapor atmosphere of Mars. So, so no oxygen. Uh, you will always need your spacesuit. Um, but for, for this period of Mars, um, this Noachian period of Mars, the, the conditions were almost Earth-like if you compare it with Earth as it was at the same time. Uh, mm, very mm, much a mm, parallel mm. um you you know earth no no oxygen atmosphere it had oceans um it had a a carbon dioxide and water vapor atmosphere uh earth was slightly different in that there was a lot of nitrogen involved as well mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm, to, mm -hmm. to buffer that atmosphere but but for mars it was pretty much all uh, carbon dioxide and water vapor. Um, but yeah, you would have had clouds, you would have had storms, you would have had rain. Um, probably in the in the very southern highlands you would have had snow. Mm. Uh, and it would have been it would have been really quite a, a strange period to be in. Um, these the, the flash floods and, and the occasional um, meteorite strike on the ocean producing these absolutely massive tsunamis that would wash in land and then drag out the debris into it back out into the oceans. Mm. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I, I've read a handful of books on the history of, of our planet Earth. And when you get to certain periods, you know, further back in time, we wouldn't recognize Earth uh, the, as we know it today. I mean, it was so dramatically different in, in many ways. I mean, obviously, there's some things that stay constant, but mm. there's so many things that are, that are very different. I was wondering, you were talking about this uh, pre-Noachian period and then mm. the Noachian. It reminds me of, a, I don't know if it's completely analogous, but of the, we, many people talk about the, the pre-Cambrian period, and then you have the you know, Cambrian period, and then all of the subsequent periods after that. So, I don't know if there's this kind of 
uh, like a pre and post, right? Geologists talk about all the time about, you know, oh, this is pre-Cambrian. Yeah. We're learning more about this, but it's very fuzzy. It's hard to really get it as much as we know about um, more closer periods for the Earth. Okay, so this is where this is where Mars and Earth are, are genuinely divergent. Um, okay, because Earth has the the process of plate tectonics mm -hmm. um the crust is for the very very great part incredibly young mm. um so when we talk about the cambrian uh we we're talking about things that are you know really old rocks mm -hmm. uh and th these really old rocks are 600 million years old mm -hmm. mars never had working plate tectonics, which means that mm. the, the crust which underlays all of the subsequent activity is four and a half billion years old. Mm. So Mars carries all of its scars, um, even in the in the, the the supposedly uninteresting northern basins, if you look carefully, you can see circular depressions um, mm. and and the the very edges of of a hint of a crater wall that are are you know hundred five hundred miles across uh, mm. these 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 plant these big impact basins. Uh, and we just don't get that on Earth. We we recycle our crust mm. every every few you know hundred million years or so. Mm. Um, but Mars never did. So Mars is the surface of Mars, especially in in the southern hemisphere, uh, is ancient. Wow. Um, we wow. the the oldest places uh, on on Earth are. are Things called cratons, mm -hmm. uh, normally found in like sort of in the middle of, of of the tectonic plates. So there's you know there's some in in places like Greenland uh, mm -hmm. where our oldest rocks are what three three and a bit billion years old. Most of the surface of Mars is four and a half billion years old. Wow, it's yeah. it's that stark a difference. Mm. Uh, it's it's genuinely a, a real stark and and startling fact that, mm. that the surface of Mars is is as we would have seen it almost um, back in back in the day. That's I, I never knew that. That's quite spectacular. I mean, that's. I mean, that's that's a that's a that's a lot to take in. <laughs> you almost have a snapshot of billions of years ago right in front of you. This is absolutely yes. astounding. Yes. Um, wow. So you mentioned it already, but in this period, you talked about water. So there there was mm. definitely water on Mars for X amount of years. Uh, could you talk about? water sure. was it water like we have water yeah yeah i mean it was it was it's it's just regular water um because of most of the you know a significant portion of the the martian atmosphere was was water vapor um the when mars then became cool uh it rained it must have rained for literally millions of years um, from the off as it as it as it cools down um, and you know if you have a meteorite impact that will that will heat the atmosphere up mm -hmm. um, some of that water will will turn back into vapor and increase mm -hmm. the atmospheric pressure again um, but overall yeah so mars has has um ocean equivalent layer uh, mm. which is if you take the, the all of the water that we believe mars had um and you're looking at, at sort of you know two three miles of of water if you spread it across the surf the whole surface of mars so it's a wow. lot of water um obviously mm. you know because mars formed further away from the sun it had a bigger load of of these of these volatiles but yeah there was there was genuine water and we can see where it was um, 
again, I was talking about the the photographic evidence that we have of Mars now. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're not talking just about big rivers. Um, oceans. Um, oceans. We're talking, we're talking about oceans. We're talking mm -hmm. about um, rivers that we can actually see that fed this ocean. Uh, we're talking about uh, valleys that have been carved by water. Uh, but more than that, uh, you know, we, we look at the valleys um, that, that have, been, that have been, been cut out by, by these, uh, these, these storms. Um, so, you know, when it rains, obviously there's no vegetation to, to stop the, the water. We're talking about um, proper, proper desert-style flash floods all the time. Um, so, so the water comes down at a tremendous force. So we can see um, where water has flowed around um, rocks and, and craters and, and flooded them and filled them in. Um, but we can also see the, 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 the edges of lakes. Mm. Uh, we can see uh, very tentatively, we can see the shorelines of, of the oceans mm. that, that, that were there. Um, we can see where rivers run into, you know, streams run into rivers that run into the the, the really big feeder streams, mm. and and this this is this is where we're sending our our robot probes. You know, at the moment, you know, Perseverance mm. is at the the bottom of Gale Crater, and and that's where we that's where we think that it was once full of water, um, and we look at the sides of the crater and we can see um, finely laminated rock. Mm. Uh, just as we would have uh, mm. that were laid down underwater. So mm. yeah, there was mm. there was definitely water there. Um, the 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 idea is, if, uh, if I'm not mistaken, if if there's water, there's life potentially. Sure. I yeah. mean, do do you? I mean, now we can we can table we can table a discussion <laughs> about how we define life. Like, what is life? Okay, like, yeah, you know, we'll table yeah. that discussion, right? Yeah, that gets, that gets, that gets, side. That gets we'll a little little night. meta. <laughs> um, but <laughs> I mean, was there? Could, do we think there was some type of organisms, uh, single celled multicellular organisms, at any point on Mars? Okay. So this is this is where I this is where I'm going to go out on a limb, um, okay. and and I'm happy to do this. Okay, um, there is no evidence of past life on Mars, um, and there is no strict evidence. We'll, I'll caveat that in a minute of of current life on Mars. Mm. However, if Life is simply a matter of conditions rather than any special ingredient, then there is no particular material difference between the conditions on Mars four billion years ago and the conditions on Earth four billion years ago. Mm. On both, you had oceans, you had cracks in the floor of those oceans, you had water that percolated down into those cracks from the ocean uh, floor um, that would then meet hot rock under the crust. Uh, and the water would uh, dissolve minerals from the rock, and then it would be forcibly ejected back out into the ocean floor. We, part of our understanding of life on Earth is a, a mechanism where um, chemical energy is utilised by other almost life chemical reactions uh, into a, a self-replicating uh, sort of way. So somehow you've got to break a chemical bond in order to create energy. Mm. Um, and, and that's what, you know, obviously plants do it. Uh, they take carbon dioxide and, and water and they use sunlight to, to make um, long chain carbohydrates, sugars and stuff like that. Mm. We use oxygen. Um, for for our 
our energy creating. Um, but there are other there are other things you can use, and one of the other things you can use you can use sulfides, um, mm. and it is believed that you can have life forming around uh, these deep ocean vents where where these hot mineralized waters are coming out um, and we can find them on our ocean floor these days we we call them black smokers mm -hmm. uh, because the 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 mineral content of the water gushing out um, of of these these things is is enough to stain the water black mm -hmm. uh, and if you look around these black smokers they're they're incredible forms of life real um extremophiles um mm -hmm. that you, you wouldn't find anywhere else because the water coming out is 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 past boiling i mean mm -hmm. it's because it's mm -hmm. you know we're, we're at the bottom of the ocean you know water can get up to 150 200 degrees centigrade um and and there are there are snails down there that use iron sulfide to to make shells with, um, and and there are crabs and all sorts of of you know different algae and stuff like that. So if you're looking for a cradle of life, and and you you look at the black smokers and you think this would produce energy that a a a early biological entity could exploit mars had those things as well as earth mm. um so yeah i i i would be confident in saying that the conditions for life existed on mars um if they existed in the same way on earth mm. that is obviously one step towards life um and i i would like to think that there was um because that that would make some sort of sense um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah from 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 how we understand uh life and how we understand evolution at least here on on earth you know the idea is that <clears throat> if it's possible to happen on earth well, if you have similar conditions on another planet, then in theory, it should be potentially there as well, sure. whether it fully explodes or because, you know, obviously we've had a, a handful of extinctions on the planet and, you know, there's just like a basically you know, a, a start and reset, start and reset kind of thing that happens on the planet with life. So, uh, or almost no, not entirely, but um, that would kind of track then, I guess, with another planet, although granted there's different uh, conditions but I, I i get your i get the logic of yeah if there's the similar conditions in theory uh you would suspect some of that you then move on to the Hes hesperian this is Chris? hesperian hesperian uh yeah. period and this is 3.7 to 3 billion years and so yeah. this in this period you talk about this is the radical change of climate and the atmosphere of mars um it was volcanic rock for a third of it and you talk about the various volcanoes that are there mm. um so you, know, you just tell us about this period and then i believe in this period is where we understand uh rust and then this is where we start to get sure. the coloring of the planet yeah. here yeah so yeah so the the whole of the the noachian was was you know relatively benign um relatively stable yeah the atmosphere was still still being thinned but you still had plenty of, of water on the on the surface of mars so very much you know one day is very much like the like the next um, now the start of the Hesperian. Uh, again, this is this is not marked by anything specific, but it's it's you know believed to be around you know three point seven billion years ago, um, and and this is where we start to get to talk about volcanism on Mars. Uh, we're not exactly certain how it started but you know it was certainly the the opportunity for it to do so uh, and we know that that it certainly happened and it was extraordinarily persistent um so tharsis um now the tharsis 
bulge, the Tharsis province, whatever you want to call it, is is this this big what we call igneous province. Um, mm. And when I say big, it's literally a third of the planet surface. Um, it's 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 a vast lump of volcanic rock that has spewed out of the side of Mars. Um, and it's it's unbalanced the planet. It has it has grown to 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 enormous heights, and this is even without the volcano itself. Um, so you're you're looking about a, a persistent, if not continuous, volcanic eruption across the surface of of Mars for billions of years. Um, which is an extraordinary length of time because obviously mm-hmm. you know our our volcanoes on earth uh, are very dependent on on the plate tectonics that that drive it mm-hmm. um, volcanoes don't last you know they last sort of ten thousand years tops so if you look at the the shield volcanoes of Hawaii um, we know that there is a hot spot of magma that's underneath the Hawaiian islands mm-hmm. but the the Pacific plate is being dragged across the top of it, um, and the volcanoes eventually lose touch with that hotspot. So you mm. you end up with a dead volcano further down the chain and a new volcano forming over the hotspot. That didn't happen on Mars. You have one hotspot, um, and it's yeah, it literally took over a third of the planet. Mm. Um, we also know from from our experience on Earth, that one big volcanic eruption can change the climate significantly for a short period of time. Um, this has happened back in in prehistory uh, and and in in the Middle Ages. You know, we 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 struggle to explain. You know, why why did this this sort of you know ten twenty year period back in the um, the the sort of like the, the six seven hundreds uh, in Europe have have such a have a, a poor record of harvests and, and 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 generally you know the population contracted and stuff like that and then you 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 find out later on well there were these series of volcanoes going off um, and and even to the point where. You know, much later on, um, we can detect, you know, big volcano goes off, lots of gases are, are erupted high into the stratosphere or atmosphere, and the planet noticeably cools by, you know, half a degree for, for, a, for a, a season. Um, now, this is what happened, on, we believe, happened on Mars, but it's not a question of well these these gases just like sort of came and they went and they came and they went we're talking about persistent and long term volcanism spewing cubic kilometers of of sulfurs and um other other nitrous oxides and stuff like that high into the atmosphere of mars that cool the planet dramatically um, so you've gone from this relatively balmy and benign um, environment, this climate where where you know you don't get frosts and you don't get uh, the extremes of, of temperature, to to a gradual cooling of the planet, uh, so that you know you have winter now, you have snow forming um, and snow perhaps that persists from one season to the next. So they start to form glaciers and ice caps. Mm. Um, the ocean will start to freeze over in, in, in Northern Hemisphere um, winter. And, and perhaps in the summer, it doesn't fully unfreeze. So there's a gradual decline during the Hesperian of, of temperature. And again, because a lot of the atmosphere of Mars is made up of water vapor. You've got a drop in air pressure as well, uh, because you are starting to lock up the atmosphere of Mars as ice. Mm. Um, so 
the lower the air pressure, the colder it gets. The colder it gets, the lower the air pressure. It's a, it's a positive feedback cycle um, mm. that will result in the atmosphere freezing out. Mm. In, in this way, there was such a dramatic change here. It seems a lot of it to the volcanic activity. Mm. Where do we see, you make a distinction in the book of there's what rust is and what it's not and how it, you know, how it contributes to the coloration and things like that. Maybe tell us the difference here between these things. I remember you sure. talking about this. Yeah. So rust as we know it is, is, a, is a hydrous oxide of, of, of iron. Um, in order to, 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 to make a hydrous oxide of iron, you need two things. You need water and you need oxygen. Um, easy way to do this is, is if you, if you get two, two jars, two, two just glass jars and a bunch of iron nails and you boil the water in one. Um, and then put the nails in it and you don't boil the water in the other. So the boiled water has had all the gases removed from it. Uh, those nails will not rust hmm. um, hardly at all. But in the, in the water you've, you've just got out of the tap, there's plenty of, of, of oxygen dissolved in that, in that water and those nails will rust really quickly. Hmm. So... On Mars, there was never any free oxygen. So, so the water, the fact that they had plenty of water means that the, the minerals on Mars are not going to rust. Mm. Um, a lot of Mars is obviously this, this, you know, black volcanic lava, uh, which is rich in one of the magnet, in one of the iron uh, ores called magnetite, and that's black. Um, Mars gets its red color from hematite, which is a, another iron ore that has more oxygens in it than magnetite does. Mm -hmm. um, and, and for absolutely ages, there was, there was this real confusion about, well, we know that the red dust is, is hematite, and we know that Mars has lots of magnetite, but how in the absence of water do we get one from the other? Mm. It turns out that all you need is you need to shake the magnetite for you know, a billion years in, in an atmosphere. So you've got little magnetite grains and you blow it in the wind. Mm. Um, for, for, for millions of years, and, and you will start to basically knock oxygen atoms around in, in the magnetite, and you will get, you'll spontaneously form hematite. It's, 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 it was a, a very dramatic and, and simple experiment, but yeah, you, mm. you, get a, you get a jar of magnetite and you just shake it for a few months, you will start to get hematite forming. Um, wow. mm. generally startling but yeah. that's how we ended up with the red red planet huh. it's interesting because there was a time where mars was not red uh as, as, as yeah. sounds like what you're yeah. saying which mars is, would have been mars would have been black that's so interesting yeah, saying, yeah if, you, if you go to if you go to hawaii um mm. and and you've got the lavas there um you know the beaches are the beaches are black Mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. of the because of the magnetite and mm -hmm. that's how mars would have looked mm -hmm. it would have is it, been black. It the same is it the same in, in iceland they have the black sand sure uh, yeah. Is that, uh -huh, uh -huh, yeah yeah that's exactly right yeah uh -huh, and that's uh -huh, that's the uh -huh. way it goes so that's that's the unoxidized uh -huh. um and broken up lava flows and that's yeah. what we would have seen yeah it's a, when, when i was when i was in iceland and the, the black sand beaches and stuff it was it was a strange experience at sure. first because you're just stepping sure. in black earth. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very strange experience. And then you kind of adjust or whatever, but again, yeah. it's a, we have but all these yeah, priors. <laughs> that's, that's what, that's what the beaches of Mars would have, would have looked like. And, and, and yeah, that would have been, that would have been weird. Okay. So walk us real quick through the, the last period, which is the Amazonian period from 3 billion years until the present day. Um, how has the climate been in this period and 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 up until now um here maybe you could talk about this can kind of lead us to kind of one of my last questions which is the ability to to for humans to visit maybe and and what, what could that be like but there it seems as if in this period there's 
you know, the, the climate is doing something. There's virtually no atmosphere there, um, all of these different things. So kind of, yeah, get us from where that starts until present day and, and some of the particular features. Sure. So the Amazonian period is is basically the last three billion years, and and yeah, you know, say earlier on I was mentioning the the Cambrian, uh, and our Cambrian, you know, it's it's really old rock, and that's six hundred million years, and that's literally one fifth mm-hmm. of the time of the of the Amazonian. The Amazonian is is an enormous stretch of time, um, and it's characterized by by basically this this thin um, atmosphere and and frozen surface um, when we talk about permafrost we 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 talk about well yeah yeah the permafrost in in Alaska and northern Canada uh, parts of Siberia uh, it's meters deep on Mars um, the permafrost is is yeah a mile deep mm. it's 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 a so cold um and and that cold has really penetrated deep into the crust Mm -hmm. um one of the odd things about mars is that you know because it hasn't got this ridiculously outsized moon that that we do Mm -hmm. um, mars wobbles all over the shop um Mm. we're we're used to our 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 summers and our winters we have an axial tilt on the planet of about 23 degrees um mars's axial tilt varies from zero that's you know straight up and down Mm. um no seasons to possibly 60 degrees over um Mm. so we're talking extremes of 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 summer and winter here so that the poles actually get more sunlight than the equator does through a year um and and this system cannot be predicted um Mm. People have looked back in the past and said, "Well, you know, if 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 Mars had had this this obliquity um, of of sixty degrees in the past, what would what would its climate have been like?" Mm-hmm. Um, but the the whole system is chaotic. There is no no predicting how Mars will will suddenly flip over um, or flip back. Uh, so there are periods on Mars where you have uh, no ice at the poles, so mm. so the the ice caps that we see now simply wouldn't exist. Um, mm. But you would have glaciers on the equator, um, and in those in those periods of of high obliquity, you are much more likely to have free water mm. uh, on the surface of Mars. Mm. So. Throughout the Amazonian, you have had periods where the glaciers have 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 marched south and then marched back north again, um, and the ice caps have melted. The air pressure has increased enough for free water to form on the surface of the planet. Um, and just show how close we are now to free water on the surface of the planet Mars. Um, When uh, the Phoenix probe landed, um, it was about 73 degrees north, quite close to the North Pole. Um, And it was predicted that there would be, um, there would be ice, you know, 30 centimeters down or so and yet when the probe landed it's it's the the rockets that helped it land uh blew away the dust and there was literally ice just under the surface Mm -hmm. um and throughout its its operational period of of one martian summer um it was it was measuring the atmosphere and the, the temperature all the time and there were points during that time when it would snow you would actually get clouds forming and it would snow on the surface of mars Mm -hmm. and it would only take at that point a rise in temperature of a few degrees for it to have actually fallen as rain Mm. so it's very close um 
and and it tantalizingly so and we just seem to have turned up um and turned our telescopes to mars during one of the periods during the amazonian where there is no free water on the surface of mars mm. uh where a lot of it is locked up as ice in the north and the south poles mm. and in the in the in the permafrost the deep permafrost which is in the in the in the northern hemisphere especially mm. this is so fascinating how we're, we're able to understand through billions of years how things are evolving and changing um, and how they, we know this with earth but then to know it um, on another planet you know with with you know good science is really really fascinating so i guess bring us uh, I'll, I'll i'll dovetail this last question into uh, into the, the the next one so so what we understand about the planet now mm -hmm. and can humans get there can they visit there and some people have said colonize and all that stuff but um what is the the idea of uh, <laughs> uh us humans getting there um my, my understanding oh. of that is that we could probably get there um and then but you know being there we couldn't be there for too long and then leaving there is pretty tough to do so it's more of the trip back is my understanding that's really difficult more than getting there so you just tell us kind of about that as well okay so let's break this down into into the three stages so we've got to get there um and with our current technology we're looking at a trip of around eight to nine months Right. right now we know because we can um put astronauts onto the international space station uh who who have lived there for over a year the that kind of thing is possible we have to resupply obviously um and and on the trip to mars we would probably have to take everything that we needed with us certainly for the first time um so for the trip to mars uh you are looking at boosting something like the size of the international space station for nine months all the way to mars so so mm -hmm. it's that's a fair engineering feat but we we should be able to manage that mm -hmm. um the second bit is, is what do we do once we're in Mars orbit? Well, we know that actually getting to the surface of Mars is hellish. Mm -hmm. um, we, we've thrown so many probes at the surface of Mars and we have missed a lot of the time. We've, we've made craters. We've, we've accidentally thrown them out into space. We've burnt up. We've, we've done all sorts of terrible things to our mm -hmm. probes. So we've got to try and get this right because we're actually dealing with live human beings at this point. Um, so one of the one of the thoughts is that we'll 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 send a a rocket with them uh, that will land on the surface of Mars uh, using retro rockets because that's probably the best way we can we can guarantee that they're going to reach the surface in one piece. Um, but what we can do to help them is we can send stuff. Um, we can send loads of stuff before the astronauts get there. So mm. we can we can send modules. We can send mm. rovers. We mm. can send. Uh, we can even send the return vehicle mm. uh, from mm. getting from Mars back to orbit again. Um, and and we we can synthesize out of the Martian atmosphere um, relatively decent rocket fuel. If we break the carbon dioxide, um, we can make oxygen. And if we can shovel water into it as well, we've got hydrogen. Um, so we've got hydrogen and we can oxygen and we can burn them together and we can we can make a bang. Um, mm -hmm. So so we good with that. We can use the water on Mars. We can literally stick a shovel into the soil of Mars in lots of places, and and we can come up with water. So so water shouldn't be a problem, uh, and we shouldn't have to take so much with it of us with it um, to the surface of Mars. When we're there, 
there are obviously problems. Uh, mm-hmm. We've got the extremes in temperature. Mm-hmm. Um, we obviously need a habitat, a sealed habitat for people to live in. Um, we've got radiation mm-hmm. because Mars doesn't have the magnetic field. Uh, it is sleeted every day by by solar unfiltered solar radiation. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's not you know it's not anything that will you know it's not like being X-rayed or anything like that. But over over the course of a of a you know months and years you are you are talking about quite a higher mm-hmm. risk of mm-hmm. of cancers and stuff like that so we should we really need to do something about that and we can do we can do that we can we can bury our our bases we can just literally shovel rock on top of our our habitats and protect us that way um we need to protect ourselves from the dust the red dust that we were talking about. Um, this is incredibly fine grained. It works almost like nanoparticles. And, and that dust will get everywhere. It will get on your spacesuit. It will get into the air that you breathe eventually. It will get into your food and it will get into your water. Um, and we don't know the long term effects of that. Um, mm-hmm. so, so that's another thing we have to watch out for. Um, but yeah, we can. Feasibly, if we throw enough money at it uh, and enough resources, no particular reason why we cannot have a voyage to Mars down to the surface, which has already been seeded by by our material, um, and make sure that we can get these people back uh, back into orbit, and then. To the to the, the the transfer ship back to Earth. How how long would would a crew of astronauts stay on Mars? Let's say everything goes well. We've got some stuff sent there. They land fine. Everything's good. How how long feasibly would they be staying there? Is this a is this a weekend kind of thing, or <laughs> or, or are they staying there for like six months and then coming back? I mean, how long would they be staying there? Well, I, if you consider that, that getting to the moon takes, well, you know, three, four days mm. and, and we spent less than, you know, maybe a day, maybe just over a day there and then coming back. So you want to spend some time. If you spent nine months traveling to get somewhere, you're not going to say, oh, OK, yeah, we, we stuck a flag in the ground, we picked up <laughs> some rocks. <laughs> Let's go home. Right, um, right. Yeah, you're gonna. Yeah, if we if we're sending people all that way, and it's going to take an eighteen month travel time at, at a conservative estimate, um, mm-hmm. that that it's going to be it's going to be good. You're going to want to spend a bit of time there. Um, yeah. There's lots of there's lots of science to do uh, on on the surface of Mars. Um, one of the things, the frustrating things about putting a rover on Mars. Um, is the 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 travel time for the for the instructions? Mm. Uh, you know, Mars can be can be you know literally light minutes away. So you can like sort of say, well, that's an interesting rock. We should move a bit closer to that. So you send the the instruction over, and and you know, a few minutes later, the, the 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 rover will acknowledge the fact that it's got a it's got the thing, and it will sort of you know drive a couple of feet closer. And then stop and wait for the next instruction. People, people are autonomous. They can they can do their stuff, mm-hmm. and and they can they can say, well, that's an interesting rock. I'll pick that up and stick it in a bag. I'll drill through there. Mm-hmm. Hey, look at this thing over here. Isn't this interesting? They can cover much more of the surface uh, and do much more of the science um, in in real time. But the other things that the people can do are, are things like well. One of the things we really want to do is we want to see how we can live mm-hmm. on other planets. So mm-hmm. we've got water, we've got dirt, um, and, and can we use that water and that dirt for growing plants? In? Can we grow food? Um, shipping, you know, six months worth of food uh, across the solar system is, is a big ask. And you can't deny the the morale booster of of saying, yeah, I mean, we've got all these 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 you know meals ready to eat and stuff like that. And and but hey, here's a lettuce 
and I grew it myself on the surface of Mars. Um, so, yeah, yeah, we've, we've got a green salad um, and most of it we've grown on Mars. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? Um, and so that's, those are the sorts of experiments we'll be doing as well. We'll be, we'll be seeing how we can grow plants um, how we can how we can live there um mm. and and yeah that's that's the sort of of, of tricky difficult science I, mm. I'm, I'm not denying that you are at the the far end of the longest supply chain in history i mean mm. we think it's terrible when when a boat gets stuck in the suez canal and <laughs> and and, and, and gums up gums up the system you yeah. are you are nine months mm. from medicine you are nine months from surgery you are mm. nine mm. months from that one spare part mm. that you need mm. for your oxygen compressor so we're going to have to plan all of this really carefully mm. yeah i mean there's every time i i've talked about this or read about it it always just seems Oh, I mean, in terms of risk, oh goodness. I mean, there's so many, there's like a thousand ways in which you can go wrong and it's just one little oh, thing and it's, 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 it's very, very, it's a lot, but I, I think it will eventually be done, but uh, it definitely is a lot. I guess the, sure. uh, the, the last question I have for you is, um, you know, a lot of, again, like I said, like I started the conversation, which was. A lot of people have, you know, li quite literally fantasized about Mars, you know, and all these things. Um, and, and, and more recently, there's been some really good, I think, or, or they're well done, I should say, uh, yeah. stories. So, uh, obviously, the big one is The Martian, which was a great book. I enjoyed that book. Um, I thought the film was great, for more or less. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> for, for All Mankind, so it was a slight spoiler, but the third season takes place on Mars. Um, sure. And then there have been other films and other uh, shows and books and things like that. What do you think about these types of characterizations of mars i mean I, th I think the martian got a lot of acclaim because of its accuracy i think it was very or more so than others it was very much like yes. oh what, what, yeah. what could that realistically look like and he's growing potatoes and you know all these things and um i mean getting off the, the planet was a little was, was definitely i think science fiction but it was very interesting the idea but yeah i mean what do you what do you make of you know again the fascination how much science fiction we have with with films and shows and novels and um with with mars more recently i mean that's there's a long history with that but uh yeah. what do you make of it more recently i guess sure well I mean, a lot of uh a lot of the more recent uh science fiction um has been very much a a, a removal from the the fantasy of of Mars, um, from the from the Edgar Rice Burroughs, um, and and even the you know the the, the Doctor Who uh, mm. Mars, the you know the Ice Warriors and, and the Waters of Mars and stuff like that um, has been have been very much now a a almost like a, a survival. Mm -hmm trope mm -hmm. uh, of you know of man against the elements mm -hmm. sort of mm -hmm. thing um and and you know those films have always been popular the the robinson crusoes mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. of of this of this sort of genre um you know if you were abandoned on mars could you survive um and and that was obviously the 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 the, the lead premise of the martian um and i i i genuinely enjoyed it um mm -hmm. i can i i can spend my my disbelief at the drop of a hat which is, which is very fortunate <laughs> right, um right. it was it's only afterwards you think okay hang on a minute mm -hmm. that 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 just doesn't quite work mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. a lot of it yeah a lot of it and especially the look of it Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we've you know, we we've we've previously got sort of, you know, the, the, the John Carter of Mars, Mar you know, the Barsoom of 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 you know four four armed creatures and and, and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Um the very much the fantasy of Mars. But but yeah, the actual look of Mars. I mean, I'm always reminded at this point that um when they made two thousand and one a space oddity. 
Oz's Odyssey. They they didn't know what the surface of the moon really looked like mm. uh, because no one had been there. So mm. so the surface of of the moon in in Kubrick's movie is kind of like, but not really like the moon. Um, but we know now. We know now, and and you know this is where um, yeah films like films like The Martian uh, and uh, and and later later developments have have really shown what the surface of Mars could actually look like. Mm. Um, one of the one of the one of the ridiculous facts about Mars is because it's significantly smaller, the horizon is really close, mm. um, and and it's like sort of yeah, it's the horizon is is what you know three four miles away mm. on on a flat landscape, and you look at it and you think. Okay, that's 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 a bit weird. Um, yeah. So these vast sort of Martian landscapes that you would get, mm-hmm. and that's slightly out because mm. what you would see is you would just see the to the horizon, um, and it's sort of like you know four or five miles either way. That's wow, um, so, so so strange. It's, it's again, it's a kind of backwards thing of how we do things here in, in yeah. uh, on, on Earth. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll leave you with one uh, uh, tidbit. Uh, this is a this is a deep cut, so many people might not know this. So some people will, but um, so I've, I enjoy science fiction and fantasy and things like that, novels, and, and I still read and I, films. And I mean, my fa- my favorite movie is two thousand one Space Odyssey. I, I I love the twenty first century version of that film, Interstellar, and so I, I enjoy science mm. science fiction and fantasy very much. One of the best science fiction series I read, um, and I've read it a few times, is uh, C.S. Lewis Space Trilogy, which I don't know if you've read it, sure. but it is absolutely yes. fantastic. I mean, I think it was written in the 30s. I mean, this stuff was... Yeah, yeah. I mean, the only, the only person before him writing this stuff was H.G. Wells, you know, maybe there's others, but I mean, there's not a whole lot of science fiction. And those are some very, very compelling stories. And I won't spoil anything, but it does take place on other planets, obviously, and, and, and yes. the whole, the whole thing. In some ways, I think that I mean, obviously, the Narnia series is great, and everyone loves it. But you know, I, I you, you read you read the space trilogy, and you think, you know what? In some ways, this might be a little bit better. I mean, it's definitely for adults; it's not for children. Yes, uh, and you can and, and you can you can see the kind of time machine rip off in the first book a little bit, but. Um, that's a fantastic space trilogy. There's, so it's just yes. the last fun question here. Do you have any, any favorites? I mean, as, as someone that has written novels, but do you have any favorite science fiction uh, uh, stories um, that you've, that you've encountered? Sure. So I'm, I'm going to mention uh, three here. Um, mm-hmm. And, and I'm, I'm going to give a, a big shout out to Dune. Um, oh, and really? obviously, you know, people, pe- people will have people will have, have, have seen the film, um, possibly both films, but the book, yeah, I mean, the the book, especially the the first the first three by Frank Herbert, um, and and yeah, I mean, there there's there's some odd stuff there, but it's 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 compelling and 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 it's political and it's environmental uh, at a time when when science fiction novels weren't weren't really grasping that and i think that that, that dune was certainly one of the one of the prototypes of, wow. of, I, of i would have of thought them. that wouldn't be the case i thought you would have because no, it's too popular no, I, I thought i thought you would have been oh, no. it's too popular or something but no, i loved it too it's it. it it great yeah, yeah it's great yeah, so, so the second one i'm going to mention is mary doria russell's the sparrow mm-hmm. uh which is an absolutely terrific book uh obviously winner of the R.C. Clarke Award, um, genuinely, genuinely compelling. And I think, yeah, I think if you if you like the uh, uh, C.S. Lewis's Space Trilogy, then mm. then then The Sparrow is is mm. certainly one of the ones that that you would need uh, mm. to read. Um, and, and last of all, I'm I'm gonna um, give a give a shout out to The Many Coloured Land by Julian May. Mm. Um, and and the the books that that follow it, um, it's it's a lot of it is based on on Irish um, Irish mythology. It's it's about 
time travel into the past and and how that affects our future um and and she wrote these four books and then another four books five books that followed it um and it, the books come an almost complete circle and mm. i have no idea whether she planned it like that but she must have had a mind like a steel trap <laughs> in order to get this 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 huge story arc over mm. so many words uh, mm. and and the stories themselves are, are compelling um, mm. beautifully written mm. lovely books mm. yeah, that's that's wonderful yeah I, I i agree with you about dune um i think it's you know i read it before the movie came out uh, i hadn't re read it in a while and and you know the first half is a little a little slow but it's a lot of the building of the yeah. world and stuff yeah. but yeah um it's really spectacular especially the second half of the book i i personally think the third one is the best um ch okay. children, children of doom yes. i think so things right yeah um i love the third book i thought it was yeah it had everything it was just so tight um i i like the second one um it's the most straightforward linear i think it's the shortest yeah um but um that third one is is really really good and there's a whole big time jump and stuff so but yeah um i would yeah. agree with that i would say you know and without dune we don't have star wars so you know yeah pretty <laughs> you know, much. Luke, lucas was very much inspired by dune and, and many other things but um well, look, Simon, it's been so much fun talking to you. I, I really, sure. uh, really uh, valued the conversation and it was, it was very, very, very informative. Uh, the book is called The Red Planet, A Natural History of Mars. Uh, where can people get the book and uh, where can people find you? Um, okay, so a uh, book in the US is published by Pegasus. In mm -hmm. the UK, it's published by Elliot and Thompson. Mm -hmm. um, and if people want to find me on, on the interwebs, um, just literally Google my name. I am the first hit. Okay, there so, you go. It's so easy. it's all good. Yeah. Yes, that's great. Well, look, this has been, been such a blast. I can't say enough thanks. And um, I, I really appreciate you coming on. This is, this is fantastic. No problem at all. All right. 